Hello there, welcome back to the booth here at Mythic Championship 2 from London. I'm Marshall Cycliff, that's Paul Chion, and we're going to be bringing you coverage of Booster Draft here. This, of course, is the first round of the tournament, Paul. This is where the nerves are highest for our players. You know, they submitted their decks uh, uh, at midnight on Wednesday local time, and now they had to just wait, right? It's yeah. just, I've, I've done my drafts, I've uh, worked on my constructed deck list, and now it's like, I just want to play, and here's where they finally get to do so. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, I have, I have noticed that the players are, there, there's a little bit of relief, there's a little less stress going on because you do have to submit your decks a little bit earlier, but of course, mm -hmm. uh, e even then, you know, w when you sit down, all you want to do is just you know, play your first land and just get, get the ball rolling. Interestingly as well, Oh, look at this. We're actually right off to the races here. Let's get going here. Paulo Vitor Damodarosa is sitting across from Neil Gutierrez, and uh, we are underway. And this is an ideal start here for Paulo. He has drafted a green-white plur proliferate deck is really what it came down to. Yeah, and what this deck is looking to do is just curve out and really just try to get plus one, plus one counters kind of across the board on their battlefield. And then, of course, have the payoff proliferate cards. Paulo, I think, has a very strong version of this with you know multiple Hualis Raptors, Bloom Hulk as ways to kind of proliferate uh, his creatures. A pretty pedestrian start here, though, for Paulo. He kicks things off with War Screecher as well as that uh, La Rune Enforcer. But on the other side, it's Sky Theater Strix. So nothing really powerful yet on the board for either player. A pretty tame start, all told. Paulo's going to chip in for one point of damage, knocking Neil Gutierrez down to 18. Yeah, and, and this tells us that Paulo did want to play a three drop this turn because he would not have the mana available on the La Rune Enforcer to tap down the Strix. Evolution, Evolution Sage, though, was the follow up play here for Paulo, and things could get very sketchy from Neil Gutierrez's side if Paulo has some type of plus one, plus one counter payoff here to get the ball rolling on this proliferate engine that Evolution Sage can enable. Yeah, we, we already know that Paulo has two copies of Jiang Yang Gu in his deck, which would be completely ridiculous here with that Evolution Sage if he does find a land. But um, Gutierrez with, you know, relatively slow start here. Just trying to build up. He's playing blue-red, which typically means you want to kind of be playing a spells deck. Blue-red spells is a classic archetype, and that is kind of like what kind of what you want to be doing in this format as well. Yeah, he's got kind of a defensive build set up here, it looks like, and uh, so far that's showing on board. The Spellkeeper Weird is a 1-4, and then he's got the 1-2 Flying Strix as well. And w one of the upsides of being green-white is you have access to lots of great combat tricks. And I'm sure Gutierrez is thinking, all right, you're attacking with this uh, Sage here. I have a 1-4. What combat trick could you possibly have? And, of course, there's a list. There's a list. And not only that, of course, this is the first major event with War of the Spark Limited. So players might not be very familiar with all the different <laughs> combat tricks available, and Gutierrez just yeah. takes it. He's like, man, I don't know, man. I'm just going to take it here. We'll just Seriously. worry about it later. <laughs> and the cool part is, is that Paulo has, like, the sentence that you would use as a professional player is, well, he could have a giant growth or something. Well, right. he actually has giant growth in yeah. his hand. The OG Liter from, <laughs> from Alpha, yeah. printed once again in our most latest set, War of the Spark. Yeah, literal giant growth. Very, very exciting. You know, I think just smart, simple, and just one of the best pump spells we, we've, we've made. You know, just... It just gives you so much bang for your buck. One mana, plus three, plus three. Very, very powerful. But of course, when you're sitting across from Paulo Vitor Domitorosa, you're like, is he bluffing me? Like, right. what's going on here? But he wasn't. He's going to use that uh, La Rune Enforcer to tap down the weird. Yeah, La Rune Enforcer, one of the best white commons. And it's been a while since we've seen, you know, a tapper this powerful uh, in Limited, especially at the common slot here. If you can see on the board here, La Rune Enforcer, one mana, one, two. One mana tap, a creature with converted mana cost two or greater. So, you know, p part of the reason why this does only tap things with converted mana cost two or greater is you don't have to play that, that awkward dance of tapper versus tapper. You know, if two La Rune Enforcers are on the battlefield, you don't have to worry about them tapping each other. On top of that, La Rune Enforcer will not be able to take down uh, a mass token. So, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes your opponents could have a big mass token, and it will not be stopped by the La Rune Enforcer. So it does have some limitations, but still one of the best commons in the set. That was Raul's outburst there from Neil G Gutierrez. Uh, 
But Paulo did use his giant growth to save his creature, though the Rouse Outburst has more text on it as well, so Nil got his uh, his value anyway, though he did not get rid of the Evolution Sage on the battlefield. Yeah, Rouse Outburst still getting you that card, so it doesn't feel the absolute worst there. Oh, and this is a nice little combination here. Paulo with Nahiri Storm of Stone using the Minus ability in conjunction with the tap effect of Larun Enforcer to get that creature off the battlefield. That's right, and that was a key play there from Paulo because while the uh, the Spellkeeper Weird wasn't doing a whole lot on the board at the moment, now that there's that Ralph's Outburst in the graveyard, it represented a very large amount of value, so Paulo said, oh, I better deal with that thing right now. Right, right. So far, though, still a very slow start here for, for Neil. Yes, he has cast some stuff that's been decent, but look at his board now. He's just down to the one, two, flying Sky Theater Strix. Okay, well, looks like I spoke a little too soon here, Paul. <laughs> he just slams two, two drops on the battlefield. That's a, yeah. what is that, a Burning Prophet and an Erratic Visionary hit the battlefield for him. So a couple of one threes, so going to be kind of difficult to get in attacks in on the ground. But keep in mind, this is one thing that um, will make the boards kind of hard to figure out is all Planeswalkers in this format have a static ability. So Nahiri's, Nahiri's static ability is on your turn. All your creatures have first strike. That's right. So, you know, oftentimes you will, I, I, I mean, I fully, oftentimes players will just make errors because they will forget that certain Planeswalkers on the battlefield have their passives. And look at this, Tulsimir, friend to wolves, hits the battlefield. For Paulo, a huge swing in his direction and things starting to look very, very good for our Hall of Famer as he slams one of his best cards. Tulsimir was his first pick in the draft. It kind of set the tone for what he wanted to do. He varied a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't like he was just on green-white uh, exclusively the whole time. But in the end, Paulo is only playing green and white in his in his deck here. He actually was looking to splash blue, but looks like he's not. Yeah, yeah, he did take that time wipe over the Kaya, and I'm sure now, given that he ended up ultimately playing just green white, really wishing to have Kaya because again, Kaya one of the best uncommons in the set. But uh, Paulo just valuing the consistency for from his deck because you know he is kind of a uh, he is playing a deck that's just looking to curve out. And you even saw co uh, combat tricks like Giant Growth. He just wants to curve out and beat down. And so he just didn't want to stretch his mana and play a card like the Time Wipe. In the meantime, he seems to be doing just fine for himself uh, without <laughs> it. He's got Tulsimir and Voya joining Tulsimir, fighting to take down the Sky the uh, Theater Strix and leaving this board state not quite untenable, but pretty close here. For Gutierrez, he has found himself in a really tough position here against the Hall of Famer. Yeah, just a pair of 1-3s on the battlefield for Gutierrez. And, yeah, I mean, he's going to need to do a lot here. Because not only that, I mean, even, you know, he, he's not really in a position to attack. He does have that Rouse Outburst, it looks like, in his hand, which wow, could... his two? Yeah, that, I mean, that, that is that is one of the strongest cards to have in the blue-red spells deck. Certainly a reason to be there. And kind of looking to maybe fire it off main phase because, of course, green-white does have access to lots of combat tricks. Cards like Battlefield Promotion and Giant Growth. Yeah, so he's going to go for that right now. And you know what he could find with it? Rao. <laughs> oh, he's got actual Rao Yeah, he has Rao Storm Conduit and Rao's Outburst times two. So pretty nice for him. Yeah, and he chooses to actually get the Lauren Enforcer off the battlefield instead of some of the 3-3s, three or maybe even going at Nahiri. Yeah, I suppose the Lauren Enforcer is close enough to a 3-3, three three, right. but with that static ability of... I, I mean, I just call it landfall. I know it's not technically, right. but it reminds me of it enough that it's like landfall ability yeah, absolutely. to proliferate. But Paulo has some good attacks here. Again, Nahiri's passive, or static ability rather, say, uh, giving all of his creatures first strike. Yep. So even if a 3-3 gets triple block, for example, in this scenario where Gutierrez has three 1-3s on the battlefield, all of Paulo's 3-3s will survive even if, even if a triple block happens because they have first strike. Oh, and as you can see, Paulo also has a War Screecher on the battlefield that chose not to attack because War Screecher has a nice little mana sink ability. Yeah, that makes this actually a lethal attack here, so Neil Gutierrez has to do something. Yeah, for six mana, 
you can give plus one, plus one to all of your other creatures. So this is representing 12 damage. So actually, Gutierrez needs to block two of these creatures or he will face lethal damage. So Gutierrez here just on chump block mode. And Paulo adds another yeah. large creature to the battlefield. And that was just draw a card and scoop up his permanence because that is game number one going to Paulo Vitor Domitorosa. All right, we're going to be back with more right after these messages. War of the Spark, Mechanic Spotlight, a mass. Hey, everybody. Uh, look, I would love to take you around Ravnica, see the sites, get the locals to explain all the new mechanics for you. We just don't have the time. The end game has begun. As you know, Nicol Bolas has been busy, and an important part of his plan is bringing the Dreadhorde, his army of Eternals from Amonkhet, right to Ravnica's doorstep. On War of the Spark cards, the invasion by the undead elite is represented by the new keyword, Amass. Let's take a look at Herald of the Dreadhorde. Amass is always followed by a number. On old Herald here, can I call you Herald? It's two. So when Herald dies, eh, farewell Herald, its triggered ability tells us to amass. Wonderful. To amass, first see if you control an army creature, and it looks like you don't. So create a 0-0 black zombie army creature token. Army is a new creature type. So 0-0 isn't like the most impressive stat line ever, but you're not done amassing yet. You get to put some plus one plus one counters on an army you control. The amass number tells you how many. End result? Harold dies and leaves behind a 2-2 zombie army. Not bad. The Dreadhorde invasion is upon us. And speaking of which, here's Dreadhorde invasion. So now your upkeep rolls around and it's time to amass one. But this time, you already control an army. Thanks, Harold. Never forget you, man. So you won't create another zombie army token. Instead, you'll just put one plus one plus one counter on the army you already control. A mass is designed so you control a single army, which you subsequently make larger. But there are ways for you to control multiple armies. Perhaps you copy an army, or one of your creatures has all creature types. If you amass and you happen to control multiple armies, you choose one of them to get all the counters. If your loyalties lie with the dragon, a mass is a great way to run over anyone who would stop you. The Dreadhorde is on Ravnica, and war is on the horizon. Prepare. And welcome back to the feature match area here in London. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe. I'm joined by Paul Chion. Hi, Paul. Hello. <laughs> and uh, we've got a, a live look in here. Let's take a look at uh, Oliver Polak Rotman. He's playing against Joe So. And uh, well, we'll figure out the board state when we pop in here. I see Tim Willoughby's uh, getting our life totals for us there. It looks like uh, Oliver says, well, you were at that life total. <laughs> <laughs> We're like just guessing what they're saying. Combat may have something to say about it. Yeah, I, I am making this up, by the way. I have no <laughs> idea what... Looks like Joe on an Esper strategy here. Yeah, let's take a look at the list here. I have Oliver, uh, Oliver's deck in front of me, and it looks like he is on Forests and Mountains. Red Green beats Power 4 matters a little bit. Indeed. He's taking advantage of some of the uh, hybrid mana cost Planeswalkers. He's got Samut, Tyrant Smasher, and Vraska Swarm's Eminence in this deck. These are cards I really have my eye on, Paul, as uh, good first picks because they go in so many different pairs of colors, and they're pretty powerful, too. Yep, definitely. And Joe really... Um, yeah, Joe, Joe is playing a blue-black deck, splashing white... <laughs> but also playing Blast Zone, so uh, a little bit uh, greedy there on the mana Wow, base, Joe. But, but uh, a lot of power. He's got four copies of Avon Eternal in his deck. Wow. Dad. The premier blue common. Yeah, excellent. So. And 
and also has Enter the God Eternals, one of the best rares, especially if you're blue-black, and then Splashing White for some removal spells and an elite card mage. And you can see that Prison Realm on the battlefield, a powerful card indeed. But not a whole lot of ways to... I mean, th th this is a this is a little bit... I mean, he's got two planes in his deck for like three white cards. Uh, oh, oh, there's also a Guild Globe, which I guess somewhat fixes your mana. It does. It does. Just, just the once, but it does. Right. And then, you know, one other advantage is, uh, especially if you're base blue, um, and you have these cards, or removal spells that are going to be good at any point in the game... Um, you know, cards. You have a lot of card draw, and having access to a lot of card draw and deck manipulation means you can actually play less sources than you would if you're, for example, just a straight red-white deck looking to splash a color. You know, cards like Tamu's Epiphany can dig you potentially six cards deep to help you find the mana to play your splash cards. Yeah, I always sort of jokingly say that cards like Divination are mana fixing, but they kind of are. Right. Yeah. Exactly. You do have a higher higher chance of just finding the land to play your splash cards. That's right. And then, of course, it has to combine well with your, your baseline <clears throat> strategy, which right. is usually to make the game go long, which also gives you a better chance to find those cards at some point. You'll often see players prioritize cards that are good either in late game or at any point that they're cast, rather than cards that are good either at a specific time or early in the game. Yeah, yeah. Especially when you're lo yeah when you're looking to splash a card, you're not going to be mostly splashing a two mana creature, for example. Right. Even if it's really good. Right. E even if it's like a Watley's Raptor. Yeah. You're not going to splash Watley's Raptor. However. You're, you are going to basically be splashing unconditional removal, you know, if you That's do right. have, if you do need something like that. Wow, this is a big turn of events here. Joe So really taking over this board. He's got, when we came in, he was getting attacked by a lot of creatures and there was a Samut on the board for Oliver. And now look at the board. It's completely whittled down to nearly nothing. And it looks like Oliver is in full on chump block mode on the ground. And Joe So has defeated it. That's the game going to Joe. Wow, that was a really impressive turnaround for him. But I've got good news for you at home. Paula Vitor Domitorosa is all set to go on the other uh, on our other match after having taken down game number one from Neil Gutierrez. But they're all set. So let's head back over there. Yeah, and Paulo, you know that game we talked about how you know he had lots of ways to put counters. He he had some cool proliferate payoffs. Didn't see a whole lot of that. It was just good old-fashioned curving out with solid creatures and then, uh, you know, play my rare bomb to win the game. The easy way. The easy way. Easy way. There's La Rune Enforcer, though, once again to kick things off for Paulo Vitor Domitorosa. Again, it's really his best open as uh, it's, it's his, I think, his only one mana spell, and it's just great. Yeah, yeah. Just a fantastic way to start out any game in Limited. He is going to... Uh Attack here, though, into the 1-3 Erratic Visionary, just to say, well, I'm not using it anyway. Oh, cancel that order. Got that Erratic Visionary off the battlefield. It looks like a Gideon's Triumph got the job done there. It was immediately replaced, though, by another Erratic Visionary. And once again, Paulo's just <laughs> like, hey, it worked last time. Let's try this again. And the, this is funny. I mean, this is one damage, right? right. But I mean, like, it matters. Just oh. taking, well, uh, and Gutierrez is really valuing the Visionary because Dude. for two mana, I mean... It's either going to be, if it's like a giant growth, I think I'm happy with having Easy. Paulo use that giant growth right away, especially because we know Gutierrez has multiple copies of Rouse Outburst in his deck. Paul, I could not have blocked quickly. Oh, yeah, I would have <laughs> slid that in really quick. <laughs> I mean, Paulo yeah. already had to use a Gideon's tr uh, Triumph there to get rid of the first one. That's right. Here's the Dreadhorde Twins now hitting the battlefield. So two, two, twos. But also, perhaps important, we'll see, is there is now an army. Right. So a mass now will start putting the counters onto that token that you see at the bottom part of the screen. And blue does have a lot of a mass. And so the, we'll see. Make sure, go ahead. Dreadhorde Dread Twins now making the makeshift battalion. 
look kind of weak here. Um, you know, three mana, looks three two, awful. right? And the twins just enters the battlefield and makes two two twos, and of course, also giving zombie tokens or mostly just amass tokens trample. Okay, well, here's our first sighting of a, an uncommon planeswalker that Paulo has two copies of. He's got Zhang Yanggu, Wildcrafter. And this is actually a really important piece of the puzzle for him. Now, he's decided not to splash, so that static ability um, won't help him unlock cards that he wouldn't be able to cast otherwise unless they're just more expensive. But this is an engine for him to spread around a bunch of plus one, plus one counters, open up his mana for some more expensive cards, and really enable proliferate to go off. Yeah, definitely. And on top of that, he making the makeshift battalion into a 4-3 is very important, especially on this board where, you know, it was looking awkward before, but now it being specifically 4-3 four, four, means that these 2-2s two are going to have trouble attacking unless Gutierrez has a way to amass or get that 4-3 off the battlefield. That's right. Rao's outburst, for example, would be absolutely phenomenal here because it would allow Gutierrez to get the, the battalion off the battlefield and allow him to attack into the Jiang Yang Gu, uh, and get that one off the battlefield as well. Also interesting is that the uh, that single plus one plus one counter, given that Paulo did not hit his land drop the last turn. Ooh, here's Rao, by the way, hitting the battlefield now for Gutierrez. But it is interesting because Paulo actually has two different things he can do with the mana. He can either use his Law Rune Enforcer or he can cast uh, Giant Growth, but it looks like he's not going to do either. He could have actually chosen to tap something end of turn why, there, why right? Why didn't he? Yeah. Uh, I, th I think he probably just Forgot, missed it. Forgot, maybe? Yeah, yeah, because the Battalion could tap for mana, and then you could use a Law Rune Enforcer. I yeah. think you want to keep the Battalion up as a blocker, but then end of turn, you do have the option of, of course, using that mana to tap something down. I mean... It's pretty likely here that Paulo probably just wants to keep that battalion back anyways, but, you know, it was a free tap. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the interesting things about Ral Storm Conduit. Now, this is a rare planeswalker, not an uncommon one like uh, Zhang on the other side of the battlefield. But loyalty, yeah. really high. That's yeah. four mana plus two off of four, so it's six loyalty sitting on the battlefield now. And even a pretty powerful board state like the one that Paulo has, just two creatures right now, but with Zhang Yanggu going, you know, could kind of present a, a, a lot of attacks. It's still going to be really difficult to actually kill Ral from this standpoint. Oh, look Ooh, at this. Watley's Raptor, though. From Paulo Vitor Damodarosa says, I can build out a much, much bigger board state than you can. That is a free proliferate on the 2-3 Raptor. And that is going to put a plus one, plus one counter on the two creatures. But let's not forget, it also puts a loyalty on Jing as well. Yeah, and look at the power. Uh, look at the synergy here. This Hualli's Raptor was put two plus one, plus one counters on his creatures and a, a, an additional loyalty counter on Jang Yangwu. So for two mana... He got four <laughs> power, five toughness, and a loyalty. Yes. That's the power of proliferate. Really impressive. And so Paulo says, well, i got to start pressuring Ral at some point here. So he's going to send in with the battalion. What is it, a 5-4 right now? Yeah, it's a 5-4. Right. So Gutierrez could look to maybe double block here to maybe try to get that off the battlefield. God, it is tempting, but boy, a combat trick. And remember, Paulo does have mana available, not just the one white, but... He's also got any creature with a plus one, plus one counter on it, thanks to Jiang, can, um, you know, tap for mana now as well. So the Law Rune Enforcer can tap for a mana as well. Yeah, absolutely. And this is why I kind of wanted to block earlier, because now Gutierrez is kind of just agonizing over the potential for Paulo to have a combat trick here, whereas maybe if, maybe if he blocked earlier and Paulo used that combat trick, it's less likely for Paulo to have something in this spot. Because now, if Paulo does have a combat trick, it's an even bigger blowout than it would have been before. Yeah, especially given the, the color pair that Paulo's in. I mean, this is the premium combat trick color pair. Right. Like, I don't care what the set is, if you know it or not. If you're green and white. It's like, do you think they might have something? It's like, yes! Yeah. <laughs> That's what these, this, this pair does. Yeah, usually green's removal spell is just very efficient combat trick. Yes, you block. Right. I'm going to play big creatures, and then I'm going to get you. Oh, and look at this. Tap for mana, and that's giant growth. Now, it looks like a two-for-one, and it is at least on board, but remember, he did get both of those creatures from the twins anyway, so he ended up trading off his four-mana right. <laughs> creature for the one-mana combat trick, so job done, giant growth in this case. And the board has been uh, brought down pretty significantly here 
But let's not forget that Gutierrez does still have Rao on the battlefield, and he's going to keep generating value now up to eight. Yeah, Paulo using the static on the Jiang Yang Gu to tap the Lawrence Enforcer for green mana for that giant growth. And Paulo has to be feeling a little bit relieved here that Gutierrez opted to use the plus on the Rao there instead of the minus because, you know, Gutierrez could come back. Imagine if he played something like a Rouse Outburst and copied it. Mm -hmm. He would be right back into this game. Yeah, and that probably was a hold-your-breath moment there for Paulo Vitor Dominarosa, right? Because that's the thing that he was really worried about was that big turn where things kind of get out of hand. And look at Paulo stuck on three lands, but, you know, Jiang Yang Gu doing a ton of work here, providing him with larger creatures and also mana sources. Out of the sideboard here for Gutierrez is an invading Manticore. So <clears throat> that actually looks pretty strong here. And I have to say, these six mana spells, you know, these aren't the, uh, the big bombs that you hope to have, but they have a big effect on the game. There's a few of these running around in the set, and, like, this one looks really strong here. Oh, and look at this. Paulo's about to go off here. What does he have? He's got an Evolution Sage that he's going to play here on top of a land. And with the Jiang Yang Gu in play, look at this. Oh, no. He has a land, too? Oh! Would proliferate everything. Holy smoke. So Paulo Vitor Dominarosa really leveraging the key component of his deck proliferate to big <laughs> effect here. This thing's getting out of hand. Look at these creatures. He's got a 6-5, a 5-4, and his one drop is a 4-5. That's insane. He's like, yeah, go ahead. I, why, why tap anything when you can just attack with your one mana 4-5? Seriously. And, and, and this is kind of the other side. You know, game one, we saw Paula just play kind of an honest game of Magic and win. But this is what you can do Ooh. with Proliferate. This is the pure upside here. Hey, uh, Neil, I think he just drew a Rouse Outburst. Oh, okay. So are we going to see the, the double Rao action here? Is this going to go down? Oh, it is. Oh, it is. Maybe not to nine. <laughs> this one has a six. Don't worry. There you go. And that means that he's going to copy this. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, look at all the value Rao here. Rao copying Rao's outburst is very on flavor here as well. Right. But this is insane. So he gets to toss around six damage anywhere he wants. And then he's going to look at the top two, get a card, look at the top two, get a card. Yeah. Appro wow. Appropriately powerful. That's right. Wow. Super impressive. Also, Rao's Storm oh. Conduit has a static ability, too. Right. Whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, Rouse Storm Conduit deals one damage to target opponent or Planeswalker. So that's really key here. Now Gutierrez can use Rouse Outburst to either kill one of the large creatures on the battlefield, and then he can use the copy, sorry, the static effect of Rouse to just finish off the Jiang Yang Gu. Yeah. But this might be a little bit too late because many of Paula's creatures this turn, uh, all of Paula's creatures this turn have more than three toughness. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be, you, you can't actually get two creatures off the battlefield here with this Rouse Outburst. Now, if he had this on the previous turn, it would have been huge. Still a big turn though, right? Because right, he, he, sure. he, he should prioritize killing the Evolution Sage so that that nonsense stops. Right. And he can get Zhang Yang Gu off the battlefield. And remember, he's going to get two cards in his hand at the end of this uh, sequence as well. So really nice play here from Gutierrez. Yeah, so it looks like he's wow. using the static on the Rao to get the Jiang Yang Gu off the battlefield and then using Rao's Outburst, copying it yeah. to get that 5-4 Evolution Sage off the battlefield as well. Right. And all of the cards. And then I assume that the Huatli's Raptor will also die? No, because um, he needed to target the Evolution Sage twice oh, with the Rao's Outburst. It was a, it was a, I thought it was a 3-3. Three, three. I think it was, it was a 5-4 because he played it, put a counter from Jiang Yang Wu, and then, then a land. land. Yeah, right. all right. So he had to do that. But that does make sense, though, right? Yeah. Like, getting rid of that engine is one of the ways that uh, Gutierrez can get himself back in this game. And look, after the dust is settled on this sequence, he'll still have Raul on the battlefield with these pretty big creatures. I mean, that was a huge play. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this is the power of Raul because it has so much loyalty that it... And with the, you know, it synergizes well with the, with the plus ability because all you're looking for is a spell to copy at some point to kind of get you back into the game. But it's also extremely difficult to get off the board because it just keeps taking up two at a time every turn. Spellkeeper Weird was the follow-up play there for Gutierrez. And then he passed the turn back. Paulo did 
tap down the Manticore on end step, but what can he do to get himself back in the lead in this game? He still has a nice board state, a lot of power going on, but it is Neil sitting there with the Rowl Storm Conduit and blockers available as well. All right, it's Bloom Hulk to once again. I mean, this is like three, four turns in a row now right. that he's been able to proliferate, and these creatures are just too big, especially for burn spells at this point. Right, absolutely. Bloom, and baby. And, and, and Paulo trying to get this Rowl off the battlefield. And this, this is the exact example of how the format slows down just a little bit, right? Because there's so many more Planeswalkers uh, in this set, of course, Planeswalker being in every pack, that sometimes you're going to have to turn your creature sideways and hit the Planeswalker. And, and as a result, you know, games go on an extra turn or two because players are not uh, just attacking each other. Yeah, that damage has to have an effect. The fact that it's right. not being sent, you know, that's a turn worth of damage, etc. And absolutely unique, of course, in this specific format. Right. Yeah, first time that the, lim that the players are navigating those type of waters, and you can see it's difficult, right? I mean, even Gutierrez, who's the one who's being attacked, let alone has to make the decision about whether to prioritize the Planeswalker, he has to say, well, how important is this to my game plan? What kind of blocks can I set up? What are the things that Paulo could have to mess this up? Yeah, and Gutierrez now just trying to keep Ral alive here because wow. I think that's kind of his, his victory condition here. He's going to double chump block here. Yep. Wow, I'm surprised by that. So if Ral's his victory condition, what does victory look like? He really needs to keep this train rolling. Now, we know he has a Spellkeeper weird, and he can use that to get back the outburst, right? Yeah, I think a card that he would really want is something like Callous Dismissal. Mm. Just being able to bounce two, two of the creatures with the four counters on them, and I think that would be one way for him to try and stabilize. Okay, he minus Ral, so he's got something big coming up. What is it? Is this a five mana spell? It is. He's tapping five mana. I didn't see what was in his Oh, it's hands. a totally lost. That's huge. Oh. It's the bounce spell. And it gets and, and, and he's gonna put them on top. Oh wow. This is I exactly feel like Paulo just totally lost this game. <laughs> well, he's uh in a much, much worse state than he was before. Look at this. You get oh to see the power of Ral. And Tony Lost, not really the type of spell that I'm super happy playing, but, I mean, in conjunction with Ral, doing so much work here. Yeah, those plus one, plus one counters now lost to the Eternities. They will not, they will not be on the creatures when Paulo draws them. And Paulo has two, well, I mean, they're reasonable draw steps, but, I mean, that is a savage two-for-one oh, yeah, from huge. Yo Gutierrez. And... Uh, you can see why he chump locked with those creatures to keep Rowl alive. He has plans. And now he's going to use Spellkeeper Weird to get back Rowl's Outburst. And then next, this turn, he can use Rowl's Outburst, copy it, and get two creatures off the battlefield wow. here with a 4-5, which lines up perfectly with that Bloomhilk on the battlefield. Wow, this is beautiful stuff. And remember, this is also going to be Gutierrez drawing two more cards. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and he gets some card selection as well. Ooh. So he says, you take two, kill your Raptor, cure your Battalion, I get to look at the top two draw card, then look at the top two draw card. I'm so jealous right now. Yeah, this he is truly <laughs> going off at this point. Paulo does remind him, well, we're going to resolve these in order. They don't all happen at once. Right. We're at the, we're, we're at the Mythic Championship here. Of you course. You've got to do things uh, very specifically. Oh, and that's a Jaya's greeting as well. Boy. Well, I, uh, uh, this is the first time that I've seen Ral Storm Conduit on the battlefield, and I am impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Same. <laughs> uh, wow, okay. look at this. He, he actually... Well, he didn't take it? No. What? Is he crazy? Well, well, it looks like he went for a um, bond... Is it, no, that wasn't a bond of passion. That looks like a bolt bend, right? I think that was a... Or was it a turret ogre? It might have been a turret ogre. Must be a turret ogre. Yeah, yeah, yeah that yeah, is yeah. what it is. He just valued being on board higher, and Paulo says, well, okay, I'll play these cards. Right, but now Neil is pulling further and further ahead with the Ral. I'm still a little bit surprised he didn't take the Jaya's Greeting because being able to copy Jaya's Greeting just seems so powerful. Yeah, you just get through so much of your library. But I guess and Neil just recognizing that he needs to win at some point. Yep. Vivian's Grizzly is what's joined the law rune enforcer there for Paulo. That's and here we go, that's Tamiyo's Epiphany. Yeah. So for those of you that have been playing for a long time, that's the functional reprint of the card 4C. It's scry four, then draw two. Yeah. And as you're gonna see how powerful it is late in the game here. Although 
as it turns out, it's uh, the rich get richer here for Gutierrez because he actually sees four spells. So normally what would happen here is, you know, on average you would see two spells and two lands. And drawing two spells is so much better than drawing two cards at this point right, in the game. Right, absolutely. I mean, at this point in the game, you know, we, we often ask... You know, what is Scry worth in the, in the end game? And I think once you get to a number this high, like Scry 4, that's basically drawing a card. Right. Right? So this is kind of close to just four mana draw three cards. Yeah, and Tamiya's Epiphany, extremely powerful. And I think in most sets, it would generally be considered the best blue common. But we also have Aven Eternal. So I think many people are on Aven Eternal being the slightly better common, but both c cards that are, you can take very, very highly and be happy with having in your deck. A little bit of missed value here for Neil Gutierrez. He plussed his Ral, but he already knew it was on top, so right. he just left it. It's like, ah, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so sad. Oh, aggressive. Well, we'll see what happens here, because he is offering a trade turret ogre for the Bloom Hulk. And Paulo just... He's going to go for the double block here on the three-powered... Or, the, excuse me, the three-toughness turret ogre. And the old, I hope you have nothing. Okay, you have nothing. Because, of course, if Gutierrez had any removal spell or pump effect, that would have been a two-for-one. Oh, and look at this. Well, the game ended, by the way, Paul. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Paul was like, I don't want to see a fully powered Ral back on the uh, battlefield because, of course, it got reset there by the Drake. Or the Sphinx, rather. Rescuer right. Sphinx. All right. Well, we're going to take uh, a short commercial break while, while our players prepare for the third and deciding game. We'll be back right after this.
And welcome back to the feature match area here in London. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe with Paul Chion. We're kicking things off here for the Mythic Championship 2 with War of the Spark Booster Draft. And we're in game number three here. Paulo Vitor Damodorosa versus Niels Neil, Gutierrez. And bang, bang, the one-two punch here from Paulo. That is a quick start against no second land here. Looks like it. It looks like Gutierrez uh, Mulligan uh, here. He and did mulligan, but did he keep a one lander and brick? That's, who, that's what it looks like. Uh oh. Oh, and look at this start from Paulo. Just the ideal one, two, three here. His best one drop, one of his best two drops into Jiang Yang Gu. All right, well, the window is narrow, right? Yeah. I mean, basically, Neil needs to find probably Neil a mountain to, uh, that right doesn't, here. That, that, that didn't feel like a land. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that, that, then this, this is pretty much going to be over here with the discard. And he, oh, check this out here. I think this is a Bloom Hulk. Come on. It's a, it's a Bloom Hulk. Come All on, right. Paulo. I mean, this is just over. And that's going to yeah. do it. Neil Gutierrez just has to extend the hand. The Spaniard says, okay, you got me. <laughs> and Paulo Vitor Domodorosa says, that's why I'm in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> I will say, to be fair, that start from Paulo was likely going to win a large percentage of these games. That's right? true. One drop, two drop, Jiang Yangu into Bloom Hulk is just going to win probably like 80% of the time. Totally. That is one of the perfect curve outs that you can get in this format. And it's still very early <laughs> in the day here. And we've already seen quite a bit of, uh, well, pro-level nonsense, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, game two was just like, I think, just kind of the highlight there, right? Because you got to see both of the decks just do its thing, right? You had Paulo just kind of putting counters left and right. I mean, he had like seven or eight additional counters placed on his creatures over the course of that game. But then, of course, you saw the spells deck turn it around with Ral in conjunction with, I guess... His outburst. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and then buying it back and just going off there, But too. there was something poetic about that. Right, right? yeah. Like, no, definitely. Ral definitely. minus, play Ral's outburst. It's like, oh, I get it. Yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah. it's just like a value explosion right. and totally nonsense. And that is, of course, what we're hoping to see as we, uh, as we work our way through the draft portion here today. Yeah, because yeah. we've got two more rounds to bring you, plus the rest of this first round before we switch over to... Modern, which is right. what we're going to be playing a little bit later on today. But for now, it's a totally different vibe down on the floor because they just don't know these cards yet, right? It's just that simple. I mean, even the, the testing teams that really put in the effort only got a chance to do a few drafts, and they weren't the same thing as what you get here. So Yeah, this is like the polar opposite of kind of what we've had before where, you know, players have had five to six weeks to prepare and really truly understand limited and also understand all the kind of the sub archetypes you can draft. But I don't think P players have had, uh, I mean, not, I don't think, players definitely have not had the opportunity to, to kind of discover even the sub archetypes. Everybody's just trying to do the straightforward things. And even then, it's super difficult. Yes. If your opponent has three mana up, who knows what they can have, they right? They probably have something. <laughs> they I got mean, it's, something. It's Paulo, right? Maybe you're just supposed to bluff every time, right? Because your opponents are like, oh, you probably have something, but I just don't know what it is. <laughs> right? Yeah, so, so that's the deal. So right now we are lining up for either Time Walk, where, by the way, we have uh, Luis Scott Vargas. We pulled him aside. Now, he's not in our main feature pod, but we decided just to kind of shine a spotlight in his direction. Uh, so we're going to get a chance to watch him. Hopefully most of the rounds are not, if not all of them, um, for this first part for, for Time Walk. Um, or we're going to see an interview, but it looks like we've got an interview with him about the deck that he drafted before we get to see him play it. So let's head to that right now. here with Luis Scott Vargas ahead of Mythic Championship 2 here in London. Now, Luis, you've been to London once before for a Pro Tour at the time, and that was pretty much your first breakout success, right? Yeah, I lost playing for top eight of uh, Pro Tour 2004, which was the all-draft Pro Tour, one of, one of, the, one of the, the fabled you know, 15 rounds of draft events. And we're going to get a chance to have a, a kind of a new drafting challenge in some respects when it comes to this Mythic Championship, because War of the Spark is not out yet. Uh, it's effectively a pre-release Pro Tour when it comes to the limited portion. I have yet to see a War of the Spark pack. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to get a chance to see a whole bunch of how your draft goes. Obviously at this point you've not had a chance to hold the cards, but I'm presuming you've done a little bit of preparation. Do you have any kind of overarching goals or plans for how you're hoping for this draft to go? Yeah, uh, as a team we've done quite a bit of preparation and I would like to draft uh, 
not a control deck exactly, but a, not an aggro deck, more of a mid-range deck. I think this is a mid-range format, uh, kind of headlined by Planeswalkers, as it should be. And almost all the color combinations are good. Some are better than the others. I would love to end up drafting five color green. I think it's a really fun deck. Yeah, it seems like there's just about enough uh, mana fixing and time in the format to be able to get those five color decks. And in your experience thus far, have you found that the format is kind of quick, kind of slow? Where, where is it falling for you? Uh, it's actually a little weird where you don't die quickly because the aggro decks don't tend to be quite as good as they have been in other formats, but you get behind quickly because of Planeswalkers and Proliferate all snowballing. So you do need to impact the board quickly. Uh, it's not exactly the same as an aggro deck or an aggro format. I would say it's somewhere, again, kind of on the faster end of a mid-range format. You have to impact the board, otherwise you're just going to get buried by a Planeswalker. So not full Dirtle, but definitely a little bit of room to experiment. Oh yeah, and, and you can see these wild decks, you know, splashing double, triple color cards of other colors, because you do have the fixing and time to do that, but you just have to make sure your early game doesn't suffer for it. So if we had to sum up where you want to be at the end of your first draft of this Mythic Championship, what are you looking for? I would love to be a black green deck splashing powerful planeswalkers of all the colors. Fantastic stuff. We'll see if he manages it at this Mythic Championship. And welcome back. We are into now Time Walk Magic. Now you can see that that uh, that marker down at the bottom. So what that means is, just for those of you that haven't done this before, is that this was recorded a little bit earlier. So it's not live, but it is this round. So perhaps stay off of your social media if you happen to follow either Luis or Sergio, um, just to avoid any spoilers. Yeah, and it looks like Sergio's up a game. So we're in looks like we're on game two here. Grateful Apparition on Luis Scott Vargas' side, kind of one of the best proliferate enablers in the format here. Two mana, one one here. We've had this effect before in the Thrumming Bird in the past. It was one, right. one in a blue, but it, this is effectively the, the same card, just in white, because Green White's trying to do the proliferate thing this time around. Yeah, with that extra little addition that seems super relevant here of hitting a Planeswalker as well. I, right, I really like that change. Yeah. It felt similar, right? It's like, right. I'm still getting through. That's the point, right? right. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, does feel, it does feel bad if you're like, well, I don't get my counters if I don't attack their Planeswalkers. So yep. this, that's a nice little bonus there. I, I really like that. That's a that's a subtle detail that you guys I think nailed. Yeah. We still have Tim in our ears, so we have to just be quiet. Looks like a Teo's light shield here for Luis. Yeah, and Luis choosing to actually put a counter on the Teo's light shield instead of the graceful apparition to grow the flyer because I mean maybe after a game he's seen that Sergio has a lot of removal and so you know you you, you want to get Sergio to use removal on not the apparition. So which is exactly what Sergio did. He actually got rid of the the light shield there. Yeah, it kind of forced the issue, but that does leave the the door open for Luis to uh, get that grateful apparition going again if he can find something with a counter. Right, right, exactly. He does need to find a way to put counters on a creature. Does he have something? Yes, he does. All right, that's a new horizons. That gets a counter going now. But Luis can't actually attack this turn because there's a war screecher on Sergio's side of the battlefield. So 1-3 brick walling the 2-2 two, two flyer. Hey, that's a big deal. He's yeah. going to need to find a way to get another counter on that uh, apparition or get rid of the, uh, the war screecher because that is the engine. So it's rising populace all over the place. Two of them now for Sergio and one for Luis. Luis does need to either put another counter on the Apparition or get the War Screecher off the battlefield because Luis is unable to connect with the Apparition. Green White actually very good at blocking the Apparition. Not only does it have the War Screecher, but it also has a Reach Creature in green that can also block the Apparition. Yeah, a little spider. little spider. Ooh, but here's a big finisher here for Sergio. That is just the conjurant, right? Okay. Oh, you're right. But still, <laughs> but still, but still, that thing, you know, threatens to trade off for two creatures. Absolutely. It is it is a large creature, but you know, that that looks 
eerily I, similar to I, I thought Ugin. it was Ugin the Ineffable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I am going to admit that here. <laughs> but still, uh, so perhaps not a big finisher, but still a nice play here for Sergio, right. uh, putting a nice big 6-6 six, six down on the ground. Yeah, definitely. Just just a, a giant creature. Yeah, it actually has counters. a downside, which is kind of interesting, in yeah. that it, when it takes damage, it loses those counters. So it kind of soaks up the damage rather than healing at the end of the turn like a right, normal right. creature would. Exactly. But it is still the type of card that you can kind of just put in any deck, you know, with colorless effect. And if you do have some ways to proliferate, it does, you know, kind of benefit off of those synergies on top of that. I'll tell you what, Luis would love one of those. Oh, but look at this. Luis getting a couple of counters. Yeah, so he gets a rising populace. So there's now two on each side. <laughs> right. But Luis is the one who's set to take advantage of them if, if he can start... Getting in with that Grateful Apparition. Yeah. That's the key. He really needs to get that War Screecher off the battlefield. Yep. Oh, and he fights and a Prison Realm. That's exactly what he's going to do. Prison Realm on War Screecher. Not the <laughs> ideal target <laughs> right. for it, but here it really is. Do what is. you got to do. I mean, if you think about it, you know what this Prison Realm was? Huh. Put three counters on your creatures. Yes, right? that's right. And it that, hit. That so was there huge. we go. Grateful Apparition gets through, hits Sergio, and boom. And now the engine's rolling because right. Sergio now is forced to find an answer. So now Sergio really needs to either find uh, a good reach creature, a good flyer, or just have a removal effect for the apparition because this apparition will snowball the game. And this is what the green-white proliferate deck is capable of doing. Luis built this deck uh, in a very streamlined way to take advantage of these synergies. This is very much, you know, a, a popper style deck, a deck built around commons and uncommons that's looking to take advantage of the way that they work together rather than just trying to play some huge card. Oh, but, uh, but this look is at huge. This. Sergio Garcia with the one two punch here, he trades off his Ugin's Conjurant, and that actually grows his two rising populace. And then on top of it, he has Wanderer's Strike, which not only takes out the key card on the other side of the battlefield, that Grateful Apparition, it gives those those populace even more plus one, plus one counters. Yeah, I mean, wow. the, the, the proliferate just back and forth. I mean, now we're like very close to even here, right? We both, they, there's two four fours on each side, a four five. Sergio's ahead on life total. So Luis now needs to find something here. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, so that is a Vivian, Champion of the Wild. Wow, Anatomic. So this is a really great turn here for Sergio. Just dumping a couple of uh, a rares on the battlefield like it ain't no thing. Yeah, it's a little... I thought. I think it's a little strange that he chose to run out the Vivian here um, and, and play out the Tomic, right? Because you can flash in Tomic because Vivian Static mm -hmm. says that you can cast creature spells as though they had flash. Yeah, perhaps just the newness of the set. Yeah, for sure. But Vivian, absolutely incredible card. Again, another one of the very powerful rares in the format. It's a way to kind of get card advantage. You can get ahead on cards with the Vivian. Uh, but on top of that, the flash effect is really hard to play against, right? If your opponent just has six mana up and passes a turn with a card in hand, you're like, should I attack? What can they have? Oh, wow. And Owatli's Raptor. As well. Somehow Sergio is playing Luis's game better than Luis oh, is playing absolutely. Luis's game this time. Yeah, well, I mean, he's got the rare. He's got the payoff in the Huatli's Raptor. I mean, yeah, and, and this is how it just proliferate. will just completely take over games. Tomic does have flying, so he's going to get in the red zone here. It's the only really clean attack. It's just a 2-3, so not a particularly fast clock, but it looks like Luis is flooding here. Yeah, now and Vivian just going to continue to put Sergio ahead on cards. Tomic is basically just a 2-3 flyer for two. Right. Uh, for, you know, in limited. There, there's technically cards in the set that, that target lands, but that just really won't come up. And Luis drawing some of kind of the filler end of his curve. Just some large creatures, but not really doing anything here. Luis really needs to... I mean, he needs a lot here. He needs to either find ways to continue proliferating... But at the same time, he still needs to deal with this Vivian, and he has no way to actually attack into the Vivian. Yeah, Thundering Saratok not going to get the job done here. Now 
That is a challenging troll, another giant creature. But, you know, one thing you often see in kind of these green-white mirrors is you're just going to have a bunch of creatures mucking up the ground. Oftentimes, flyers will get it done. And now Sergio getting that an another card off this Vivian. And remember, he can play all those creatures at instant speed. So really, really making it difficult for Luis to get in attacks. Yeah, and Luis just can't find action here. He's got, he had Bond of Flourishing. That didn't get him really where he wanted to go. Now he's just got lands in hand. And a Lowry Enforcer at instant speed out of Sergio. Giving, plusing uh, the Vivian, giving the Tomic Vigilance and Reach, flying and Reach, I guess. Sure. <laughs> A Johnny's pride mate for Luis Scott Vargas a bit late here. He is playing, uh, I believe, three of those in his deck. Let me just take a quick check here. Yeah, he's got a lot of ways to proliferate, and he's playing some, some maybe sub uh, suboptimal uh, ways to gain life just to be able to trigger the pride mate because his deck is, it's kind of like a combo deck. It you is. You just need to get some counters on your creatures, and then you can just try to win with all of your proliferate synergies. Yeah, and it is actually three Grateful Apparition and three Johnny's Pride wow. Mate. Yeah, so yeah. just getting the single counter on the Pride Mate can let him go off, but it looks like that ship has sailed as Luis has fallen super far behind here. He's down to just four life and facing down a superior board state. And a steady aim here. No, 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 sorry. Band together being used to get that Tomic off the battlefield. Band together. P premium premium removal, removal spell. Yeah, yep. yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the best actual uh, green removal effects we've seen in a while as well, especially at common. This was, this was also very powerful because it is not a fight effect. It's actually one-sided. So you can, you can target multiple creatures that you have, and oftentimes you're going to be able to get what you need. Sergio playing a lot faster. <laughs> In the meantime, things really falling away here for Luis Scott Vargas, who's already finds himself down a game. And Sergio Garcia Gonzalez, well, his board is just bigger. Like I said, they're both playing a similar game plan here, a green-white base strategy around counters and proliferate. But Luis actually hasn't been able to get the ball rolling, and he's just been finding a bunch of his, well, kind of mediocre stuff late. You right. know, a two-drop here, uh, you know, a, a three drop there, and it's just not really getting the job. Then he did find another copy of Grateful Apparition, but it has been tapped down. He just by way the too far La behind. Enforcer, and that's yep. going to do it. Sergio Garcia Gonzalez, well done. Defeats Luis Scott Vargas here in his first round. I mean, boy, you show up to the PT, like, all right, let's get this thing going. And you said, oh, I'm playing Luis? Right. Like, come on, this is ridiculous. And uh, then you managed to pick up the win. So great job for him. That's going to do it for round number one here. We've got a short commercial break. When we come back, we'll have more limited here from Mythic Championship 2 in London. Don't go anywhere.